Ladies and gentlemen, I'm back on Press R and I'm filled with joy to welcome you to today's edition of the program. Thumbs up to Mokwale Prince Will Laduma, who kept Press R mantle glowing. Great countries of the world gained their fame through revolutions. America, France, Russia, China, name them. Africa was not there. The Industrial Revolution that has carried across centuries, expanding through gold, gas, electronics, nuclear power, internet, and renewable energy, Africa was left behind. Today, technology has compressed the world into a global village, and the globe is going through digital, digital transformation. This time, Africa is present and Cameroon is active. What future will such transformation bring to Cameroon? Of course, Cameroon is just a case study. We talk about Nigeria, Morocco, South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, all across Africa. Cameroon as a case study, we're going to look at what future will such digital transformation bring to our country. And to talk about this today, we have just the specialist in digital transformation some of them who have come to cameroon because there was a week-long summit call it conference in cameroon that made cameroon the capital of africa digital capital of africa join me welcome from ban emmanuel who is a journalist and it specialist welcome thank you kilian it's a pleasure to be here again Thank you very much. I called you. You were in Boya. You traveled overnight for this program. Thank Absolutely. you once again. Thank you so much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Folusho Ayeni, who is an expert in ICT and an expert in international development. Thank you, welcome, you. Prof. Thank you so much. My pleasure. This should be the first time you are on this set. On Presso, yes. And you are used to Cameroon yes. through the ICT development. Absolutely. Thank you I'm very much. Here. Thank you. Yes. Excited uh, to be here. I should, I should say the summit in Cameroon, you were the chair. Yes. I was the conference chair. They just concluded week long summit and conference. Yeah. Which you had yeah, our Cameroon. minister of post and telecommunications. We had you had people from across the world. Yes. Yeah, from countries like we from UK, US, Canada, Kenya, Rwanda, Gambia. I mean, name, you know, name all the Botswana. From, from Botswana. We had someone from Botswana too, okay. yes. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here. Thank you, you so tell much, Kenya. Tell us how we can use this digitalization to transform Cameroon. Yes. And we are transforming Cameroon using Cameroon as an example. Yes. We are using uh, Nigeria. Nigeria, yes. As That's an, your as next door neighbor. <laughs> yes. Okay. Born in Nigeria. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, Dina Epale is a public affairs and government relations professional. I want to particularly uh, welcome you to this set, Dina. I met you last year. Uh, you came to Cameroon for the first time after a long time. Welcome first to present. Thank you very much, Kenyan. It's my pleasure being here. Yes, last year you told me you marveled me with uh, your stay out of Cameroon. How long? Um, interestingly, I'd been out of Cameroon for 30 years. Actually, it's now 32 years. Um, but yeah, last year was the first time I was back in 30 years. This is uh, marvelous. It, I'm, I'm telling you, staying away from your own country for 30 years. Now, what actually pulled you back to Cameroon? I'd say simply it was a series of, um, call them coincidences, um, coincidence brought me here. I had initially wanted to come and bring my family who, my two kids are born overseas, my wife is um, not from Cameroon, and I thought it, it's important for them to know my heritage, their grandfather, grandparents' heritage, and so I planned to do such a trip, but it just, circumstances, it just didn't happen. Um, but I made it a point of, of, I made it an obligation for me to come. And then it so happened, coincidentally, I was talking to Professor Mbarika, um, which many of you may not know that we are um, classmates oh. from primary school, and we've kept in touch all these years. I know about the ICT University, and one thing led to another, and I was asked to come and give a talk 
during the graduating ceremony. So it was a welcome back to Cameroon after 30 years of being away. We are very elated. We are happy to receive you. And when you come back after this length of time, we know you have a basket full of things you're going to bring back to develop this country, our beloved country. And as I say, you are coming, Professor Victor Barica, who is the, an expert in ICT and the president of the Board of Trustees of the ICT University is right here again. We always bring you when we talk digital transformation, especially uh, things that deal with uh, ICT, which is the new trend. That is where we have the latest revolution in the world. Prof, welcome, and thank you for what you're doing to this country, bringing so many people. No, thank you, uh, Kilian, and the entire CRTV for receiving me here multiple times. And like we rightly say, we want Cameroon to be the digital capital of Africa, and we will make it happen. Thank you very much, and ladies and gentlemen, stay glue. You're going to uh, see just exactly what you need to know, what the world today is moving into, and there is no way you will stay away from it. Either you are with it, or you crash alone. The digital world. We begin with the press review. Press Review talks about what the newspapers fed on the week that just ended. Bowel did the press review for us. Cameroonian newspapers have been capturing the good, the bad and the ugly events that unfolded over the week. The Guardian Post on Wednesday reports of a total of 13 lives lost under 48 hours as a result of a road accident and landslide that occurred in the towns of Douala, Boya and Marwa. For the Horizon newspaper, it was a black Wednesday as a fatal accident in Great Support Market in Boya claimed the lives of two persons. Thursday's publication of the Guardian Post takes a moment to do a balance sheet of road accidents in the past six months. The paper details that 256 people have died and 254 others injured out of 3,413 road accidents that have occurred lately. Newswatch this week reports on the sickening height which Cameroon's corruption has reached according to barrister Kerry Muna. The paper says... During the commemoration of the African Anti-Corruption Day, the legal luminary used the opportunity to open the country's corruption can of worms. In the Horizon newspaper, barrister Kerry Muna attributes Cameroon's sorry corruption state to the absence of political will. The Herald Tribune adds that journalists have been called to take reporting on corruption issues a notch higher. Still this week, Cameroon Tribune talks of the instructions given to journalists and media practitioners by the National Communication Council against the derogatory attitudes of some guests on TV programs. The Guardian Post goes further to report that journalists will henceforth bear the brunt for the unruly behavior of their guests on set. Similarly, Thursday's publication of Cameroon Tribune headlines on the warning given by the Senior Divisional Officer from Fundi against anyone inciting an uprising through the media or creating public disorder in the division. The lone bilingual daily also presents the lurking danger looming over the circulation of toxic products like rat poison and pesticides which are often at the origin of several mishaps in the society. On a lighter note, the same newspaper publication indicates that the prices of beer have remained unchanged following consultations between the Minister of Trade and actors in the brewery sector. The Horizon on July 18 reports as well that the Interim Minister of Mines, Professor Fu Callistos Gentry, has set the record straight over the alleged granting of 24 mining permits to Australian firm. And Cameroon will henceforth be the sole annual host of the ICT for Africa conference, reports the Horizon newspaper. Municipal updates adds that Mauritius ex-president and Eric Chinje joined their voices to urge the youth at the conference to embrace artificial intelligence. Those are the papers with your R with the press. Thank you very much. Uh, 
fun band Emmanuel, you are the press man uh, on the panel. Uh, what have you identified um, that press review for us to talk about? Just one, one topic is enough. Yes, Kilian, I think I cannot say other, any other thing um, apart from the accident, which I see that is a, really a priority in this case. Um, I don't know if the 256 that is given is added to the figures that we had in Boya, just within the week where uh, one guy who was driving recklessly uh, crushed, I think, three people who died instantly and some others were were wounded and this is a week uh, you really get a week go on without having instance of an accident uh, caused by reckless driving and also unfortunately the state of roads because to be that like to talk of the state of roads we must be very candid that most of the routes uh, connecting our regional capitals they are not really uh, of good state and i think that it's uh, a call for the government to see how to be able to handle this because looking for instance the routes connecting the littoral region to uh, the southwest that's duala boya it's horrible and it's a road where every time cars are at high speed to uh, transport people, be it living from Boya to to Yaoundé, Douala, or vice versa, and uh, most often it becomes even very dangerous. Where when we have rainfalls, where we have situations where water fills potholes, and sometimes people driving cannot even see. So sometimes you drive, you are driving, and you see a flat surface. You're thinking that, but there's a deep hole. When you get to it, sometimes if you're not careful. It's often re results to an accident. But uh, apart from this, we have to be very candid. People need to be very responsible in the way they drive because yes. it's really, really terrible. Thank you. I like the way you've ended your intervention by saying that people need to be responsible. And statistics show that 70% of accidents on our roads are caused by human error, which takes it back to what you were talking about. Absolutely. People should be responsible. Absolutely. And when again you come uh, to tell us that the nature of the roads are so, uh, nature of the road is so bad, we accept. But the nature of the road, the state of the road only causes 10% of accidents on our road. Now, the 20 other percent, because we talked of 70, I've talked about 10, the 20 other percent of accidents on our road are caused by the state of the vehicle, the technical state of the vehicle. It means um, drivers, road users, that is where we have to put a lot of attention. Because if the road is bad, that is uh, it helps you to go slowly. should not speed on a bad road. Yes, uh, Prof. K Killian, please, let me really talk about it. Uh, Emma, you know I love you, and you're you a great journalist, you're a great guy. Uh, but this is what I always say on all the media I appear all over the world about Africa. Uh, you made a very great point from the news that you have thousands of people dying and it is this particular one in Boya due to reckless driving. Mm -hmm. And then you turned around and talked about the state of the roads and, 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 and other things. I think we need to start holding Africans, not just Cameroonians, responsible. If you're sending out bad vehicles, you're a businessman, you're not looking at the brakes to send your drivers out. You're saying your drivers are working 11, 12 hours. They're tired. They're killing people. We should hold Africans responsible. Yes. And not always the government. This whole thing where... If there is an issue, we must bring in the government's name. No, governments are not rich. Governments don't have money. I'm telling you this. I don't know about Cameroon government. I've dealt with many other governments around the world. I'm Cameroon, just beginning a lot of my... Cameroon government my, has a lot of money to pay civil servants. Eh? Well, I, 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 don't, I can't speak well, much about Cameroon so, government. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just servants. beginning to know people mm -hmm. in the government. But my, 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 I have dealt with so many governments. Governments do not have money mm -hmm. to do everything. So... Like that guy that hit some three and killed three on the spot. He may be locked up and some influential person come and remove him the next minute. Yeah. Guess what? He will go and kill people again. He will be removed because maybe he has some connections. Yeah, we, so it comes back, Kilian, to what some of us have been bringing 
to the attention of not just Cameroon, but all African countries I go to, we Africans must take responsibilities. We are killing people. Exactly. The government has nothing to do with that killing. Yeah. If the road is bad, slow down. Don't go around and killing three people in Boya. I want to just caution that I think even at the policy level, because if a decision is made today that if you have an accident that kills somebody, your driving license will be seized. That's done already. Drive, I, That's done for so many years. Yes, so As we speak, there are drivers who are in prison for yes. killing on the highway. So and uh, just last week, we were talking about uh, all those 53, 50, 256 in just a short time. Uh, it includes, I forgot to tell you that it includes those accidents in Boya because they were public and, and, and registered. Um, three different uh, uh, transport agencies were suspended, some for seven days, some for a number of, of days, and before we've had some suspended for one month or for uh, indefinite, uh, 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 until further notice. That is done. Okay. There, is policy. there is something yes. which the Minister of, uh, Ministry of Transport, uh, a, a road safety measure, which they started once and it could not go for long, like using acolyzers yes. to test uh, it is done. drivers on the... But I, 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 I travel often, I've not seen Are you any... Anyway, I travel, okay. but I've not seen any road security no, that is uh, officer Drivers using acolyzers to take test. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Mm. That, that actually it is not actually at the, the level where we want it to be, but it is done. Okay. Um, I've been carrying out uh, uh, road safety uh, campaigns with the National Gendarmerie. Uh, it was started way back in 2011. And it has been going on systematically. It has even been uh, revolutionized these days, where you have only experts go to the field in road safety. Um, the National Gendarmerie has been doing that. The Ministry of Transport has been doing that. There are still accidents occurring. We are saying that they should step up their uh, their campaigns Let them on, also the, on the highway. Uh, I think checking because cars that uh, are overloaded. You get even cars on the highway with people sitting on the driver's seat, <laughs> and they drive past the police but control, that, and <coughs> nobody does anything. Uh, that, that is it, uh, mm. Professor Folusu. Mm -hmm. um, when you hear this, you are not actually based here. Yeah. Uh, you must be taken aback when you hear that uh, we have all these uh, recklessness on the way, bad roads, and the rest. You, mm -hmm. you are not used to this, are you? I mean, I'm, I visit Africa often. Mm -hmm. um, just about four times a year and it's not unique to Cameroon I mean several countries in Africa like that especially you know from the east central and west Africa I mean, southern Africa is a bit better uh, but everything boils down to being responsible right we've talked about drag drinking while driving by drivers texting why you know why driving even phone calls why driving without the hands free uh these are some of the major causes and finally over speeding where people don't respect speed limits in this part of the world uh i know there's been a lot of um road safety officers on the road but you know are they really holding people accountable uh so uh it's not majority of the accidents are caused by irresponsibility and not bad roads itself um someone tells me i can drive from Douala to yaounde in two and a half hours right um this is normally with that condition of that road you shouldn't be able to drive that road in two and a half it should be four or five hours that at the very least but you know we see people saying they will get to Douala from yaounde in two and a half hours why that's that means that person is going to go 160 170 kilometers an hour uh, which is very risky. So, uh, as Africans, we should begin to think, you know, take our lives very seriously. I mean, one split second, you are gone, right? So, it's about being responsible on the road. And I know we can, we government has their own part to do by fixing those roads, but as drivers, you know, on the road, we should be very responsible. Very much so, Professor Ofolu. So, because your recklessness as a driver mm -hmm. puts at a peril the lives of innocent people. You, because you are responsible, so many families suffer sometimes for the rest of their life. So, uh, I see with you. Yes, Dina, something on this. You, you've been away for 30 years. You are used to <laughs> you are used to highways with no obstacles. You come and hear this type of story here. What would you advise our people to do? Well, I think as um, my very good colleagues have said, um, individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. Individuals need to take responsibilities regarding how they approach things. Um, in Canada, where I live, um, speeding is an issue, mm -hmm. right? People speed. Okay. But 
what is the deterrent, one of the things is the rules that are set into, in place so that if uh, someone is going above the speed limit, if they are caught, the penalties are severe. Mm -hmm. But there's also an education that goes with that about the risk mm -hmm. of speeding. At the end of the day, my view is it boils down to the individual. Mm -hmm. You are behind the steering wheel. Nobody is forcing you to go at 120. If the speed limit or if the road is narrow, it's common sense. Slow down, right? But we, those choices are made. I say they are choices that people make to do risky things that put other, that endanger the lives of others. So I think before, while we are reflecting on what needs to be done, let's take a reflection on what we can do. Let's start from there. What changes can we do to ensure that when we go out there on the road, like if I was to take the car now, I have to put in mind there are kids crossing the road, there are people crossing the road. Let me be a, a responsible adult behind that wheel and ensure that I don't risk their lives. And if it happens that you are not responsible, you rightly put it, the sanctions should be so deterring in such a way that you try it once, others will see you and will never do that. I think that uh, it boils down to sanctioning irresponsible road users and doing that so severe that it deters all the others. Now, we, uh, we just take two minutes um, a kind of introduction into our topic. We're talking about digital transformation and we want to look at what future it holds for Cameroon and why not for the rest of the African continent. Uh, for the rest of the African continent. Cameroon is Africa in miniature. So why not what happens in Cameroon happens elsewhere in Africa. So uh, this weekend from Thursday we had the global technological outage mm -hmm. where Businesses were grounded, aeroplane, those who use digital um, information, technology to do business were grounded. Now, our topic today is digital transformation. The question I ask all of you, the four of you who are directly or indirectly related to um, ICT, uh, digital transformation, or the new technology, you are saying it has come to stay. And then somebody could just get up one day and shut it down. A wizard in technology just gets it and then discovers, you call it a virus, injects it into the system. And we are total blackout for one day, two days, one month, two months, one year. Is it possible? Talk to us about this, Professor. Okay. Um, I will start by saying that, you know, uh, a chain is as strong as its weakest link, um, and that's the issue of cyber security. Um, right now, currently, a colleague of mine at the University of Maryland are working on um, a research on human factors, right? Uh, and this is the major cause of that outage, right, according to the media and the company CrowdStrike, of, uh, who is responsible for the technology, um, cyber, so the security part of uh, the information systems that, shut, that, that got shut down. Um, so... Uh, I think we should we should start um, reviewing some governance, risk, compliance issues with with security, uh, right? Um, we have some of disgruntled employees that may not be happy. I mean, you know, even cause some of these things. So uh, we should expand the human factors base in cyber security uh, these days because um, there, there was a lot of loss of money during uh, during this technology outage. Businesses shut down, flights cancelled. We had colleagues of ours who were supposed to travel on Friday back to the U.S. after the conference. Uh, their flight got cancelled also. Uh, so it, and it has a ripple effect. They had to miss their connecting flight and everything. So uh, cyber security is a very big issue. And that's why um, even as uh, institution, ICT University, we continue to train. We need more skills in that. Uh, we need more, more people, more experts in cyber security um, to deal with some of these issues. Because some of these issues are not external when it comes to cyber security. They're, 
internal internal issues uh which you know the company also accepted their fault it is our fault it is internal issue we're working to resolve this and the good thing is that the, you know the response time the re to the time they had to resolve this thing was very short but in three hours they were able to resolve it and that's you know that's that's the good accolade i can give them a you know a round of applause for them and uh, they were able to fix this you know uh immediately but of course it had cost you know major outbreaks major delay uh, in this so but what do i want to bring from this we should and it's a feature let's talk about africa yeah i mean as it goes down to africa we need to start thinking and training more people in cyber security we've been talking about cyber security for many years now but now is the time and this is this is a very big evidence to see that we still need skills we still need more human talent in cyber security and most especially in the area of human factors of cyber security people need to keep learning um, of course there are external attacks and people need to get ready keep learning keep upskilling reskilling uh, in the area of cyber security Emma, I've worked with you for quite some time I'm close to you and uh, I know what you can do in IT at one point you track someone who hacked a phone right to where the person was as an individual Absolutely. so how dangerous is uh, something like the global tech outage that we had given that you also know how you can track someone we means everybody who can track someone can also maybe invent a virus to you know inject into the system of uh, uh, digital uh, space yeah, uh, Kila, you know, the digital space is quite very funny in that sometimes you have people who are very great who uh, sometimes want to threaten institutions that they say these are the best in this, these are the best in this. We've had stories all over the world uh, where there are hackers who got jobs because they hacked into a system and they noticed that this was, if this guy could uh, hack this system, it means he was just very competent too. So the uh, people who try to show their prowess in this sector by just trying to challenge certain systems that they feel that this is the best. And um, this is not really, uh, because these are issues we are still, we are always going to have in as much as we are having evolution in, in technology. There are people who would always want to challenge and show off that they they may do it hiddenly they may do it just to be able to tarnish the name of certain institutions delivering certain services they may do it just to weaken their strength and it could even be their rivals who are doing it too so the intentions uh or the, 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 the a variety of intentions that um would happen but in as much as we're operating in this space, always be ready for these uh, challenges. Uh, yes, always be very ready for these challenges. And always know that there's no moment where you're going to fold your arms uh, and say you are providing the best security. Even when you feel that you have the best security, you still need to make sure that your security experts, they are actually reforming and modifying every single second because once we have it today, we have most of what we do sometimes in systems, in, the, in most systems, especially they have to use passwords, the condition that if it's password, they make sure that it changes maybe in two days or you use it for just for some few days and you change you use it. So uh, these are things that comes with uh, technology and we cannot run away from technology. We have to always be very ready, arm ourselves for these contingencies. And uh, if we're very much prepared that they can happen any time, we will not have any problem. We will prepare to fight them at any point in time they erupt. You have fast forwarded. We're going to end it and go into our discussion because you have fast forwarded what I wanted to, <laughs> to talk about. Uh, talking about uh, challenges, uh, I will just get to Professor Victor Barica, who had a, a, a talk on the opportunities, the challenges, and the future of uh, digital transformation in Africa. That is, um, uh, Africa, uh, you're going to tell us exactly what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, and what future do we have in this? The opportunities are tremendous. Digital transformation, you see, like I always talk about, when we train students at IC2 University, we don't train them to look for jobs. So the opportunity many of them are doing right now is that they act as consultants to even foreign companies, but right from right here in Cameroon. Digital transformation has allowed them to be able to say, okay, even if 
I, can, I, do, I cannot, I don't want to go and get a job from the government or from private sector in Cameroon or in Nigeria. We have students all over the world. I can go online and manage the database system of a company in Australia. We have students that manage websites of professors I know in America. Okay, they manage their websites from Cameroon and they are paid. This is digital transformation is provided employment. And that's why I keep criticizing that many times as Africans, we say we don't have enough technology. What we have now is good enough to be able to do work internationally without ever leaving Cameroon. Those are opportunities I can give in employment. I don't think there's anything better than employment provision for, from digital transformation. What are the challenges? We've started talking. Cyber security is an issue. Any system that is online is prone to cyber attacks. That is why this domain of technology, of ICT, is a domain no government, no military is strong enough to fight against it because it's online. No, no, even the White House has cyber attacks all the day, all the time. The Pentagon has cyber attacks all the time, all the time. They have entire departments that spend millions of dollars just to protect their systems. I know that firsthand. There's some stuff I can't talk in public, but they do have those attacks. So, uh, 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 the, the, the thing that happens many times, Killian, is that when we develop, when, when, when some of our local government, even in Africa, develop a system and there's a problem, people automatically say, oh, money has been stolen, so the most system. When the visa system, the e-visa system started for, in Cameroon, it had problems in the first few weeks. People say, you see, this thing will never work. Now, almost all our visitors from outside the country today did not, mm -hmm. that came for the ICT mm -hmm. for Africa conference, did not need to go to any Cameroon embassy to get visa. They all went online, mm. got their visa, and to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Chairman, I did not hear any complaint, no complaint. for them to get visas. They get, so hours. systems, every system is prone to attack. Um, so sometimes we are too, we, we, we are too demanding. A technology system is prone to fail at one point or another. Even a, see, we, we had I had a complaint from a student at ICT University last week. They were reporting the administration of ICT University. You know the report. That the ACs have not worked for a few days. The air conditioner in classrooms, they were complaining. Because we have air conditioner in all our classrooms at ICT University. Air conditioners can go bad. Any IT system can go bad. But their complaint was that they did not have thank the AC. So, Th thank you. all technologies have problems, sir, uh, Killian. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to get over to you, Dina. Um, what can we do to harness AI, which is now the revolution that we have today in digital transformation uh, how do we harness ai african um, artificial intelligence for african progress how do we do that well i'll start by saying technology is the great equalizer and in harnessing artificial intelligence for progress one of the things i um, the recent conference that was held um, ict for africa i moderated a panel um, on that same topic, harnessing artificial intelligence for Africa's progress. One of the things that came out, and we had various experts, various people from different um, level of expertise um, on the panel, and it was a wonderful panel with great discussion. Some of the things that we heard in, in terms of harnessing potential. There is a, a lot of potential that already exists. Some of the things, and ICT is good, doing a, a great job in that education. Education is key. This is the future. In fact, it's the now, right? So I, ICT University is well placed to be giving people, the students, the next generation, the training required to um, advance things. Yeah, let's, let's be talking more about uh, ICT training. Uh, we're not focused on a university, okay? Hmm? You, you, have, you have the flow. Continue. Yeah. So when, if I can get your question again? Uh, uh, we, we are talking about, not about the university, right. we're talking about the training. Okay. Mm. So training, different types of training. Um, so when it comes to the training that, to harness the potential, right? Yes. We talk about different things. We, one of the things that we looked at was um, three, three areas that our panel focused on or one of the discussion was on agriculture, okay. was on education, 
and there was a third one. But let's take even the, the agriculture. Healthcare. Healthcare, exactly, right? What can we do in those areas? They identify things that can be done in those areas to improve what is already on the ground in order to harness. And when we harness, we're improving what is existing. We're building on, um, on, on things that are already there to make us be able to deliver services that are st outstanding. And so such services are going to end up being better health services for the, for the um, citizens, which in turn will transform them into address some of the health care issues that are in place. Now. Yes, uh, talking about education is um, aerially talked about. What specifically do we focus on when we take education as a subtopic? You want to hear dinner or you, you want to continue dinner? May, um, yeah, add, add your voice to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure um, let me say here that um, there's a lot of potential to accelerate technology in, uh, in Africa and Cameroon. Um, the technology sector in this part of the world is still underexploited. And um, when we talk about education, it's about um, people owning their own skills. I mean, think products, right? Uh, uh, you agree with me, Killian. In 2004, when uh, Mark Zuckerberg started the idea of Facebook, his plan was to actually solve a very local problem, uh, which was to make people in, at Harvard, you know, students at Harvard communicate from dorm to dorm, dormitory to dormitory. That was the plan for Facebook. But it's history today, right? Uh, it's beyond Harvard University, but global. He wanted to solve a local problem, and that is what I tell um, youth and women in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, including Cameroon. Uh, we need to start thinking of products to solve global problems. And I, I told them uh, to solve local problems. And I was saying, in technology today, there's nothing like competition. As a matter of fact, competition is very good because it makes prices go down. I mean, it mm, exactly, prices. Exactly. Uh, for example, um, I will use Nigeria as a next-door neighbor today. In Nigeria, we have several ride ailing services. And when I say that, we have, you know, Uber, right? Like you have younger. But in Nigeria today, we have about six or seven of them competing with each other. Right now in Cameroon, I just hear of Yango, Yango, Yango. So can, can one youth wake up one day and say, I want to compete with Yango? I don't know the origin of Yango, if it's owned by a Cameroonian or not. I mean, I don't know. But someone can also wake up. Exactly. Yeah. Before you continue, yeah. I've used one of those services in Nigeria, and it's wonderful. Yeah. At the airport, they are fighting to take you, and they make sure they provide the best services mm -hmm. that you can have. And they make it is none of your luggage yes. is missing. Yes. And you have, you have you can trace them. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's yes. a very good example. Yes, so um, youth should wake up and think about products to solve local problem. It can even be a Yaounde problem. It doesn't have to be the entire Cameroon. And um, I was saying during the ICT for Africa conference that just in the first half of 2024. Um, African-based tech startups uh, raised $700 million, almost a billion dollars in funding. And, you know, 50% of that money actually went to Nigeria and other African countries shared the remaining 50%. So there's a lot of potential. There's money out there. Investors are beginning. In fact, investors are more in interested in products from Africa right now because they know that it's still underexploited. Um, and they could make, you know, a lot of profit. They don't have to pay a lot of taxes like in the Western world and a lot of, you know, the expenses, running expenses, uh, capex, you know, all those things are lesser in Africa. So they want to push money here. So um, the average youth and woman um, should not wait for government to create that opportunity. There's technology. I said it during the IST for Africa conference that one internet enabled device is all you need to change the world right now today. Yes, Dina, uh, Prof. Uh, Ayene just talked about youth and women. You were talking about education. Where is actually the place of the youth and women in this in harnessing um, uh, AI for the progress of Africa? Where, where is the place of youth and you, women? Yeah, young people and women. Oh, definitely there is a place for them. I'll say, for example, you take youth. Youth, that's the future, right? Um, they live in the world of... And I'll give you an example of my kids. My kids are more technologically advanced than I am mm. because they are born into, into this technology. I have to learn it. For them, it's more, it becomes more, it's part of their everyday life. So youth have a role to play because what they are learning now, the, the, way we work, the way we are working now is not the way our kids will work. 
And so we see it's important that the youth get the skills, right, that would enable them when they go out to reach the, the stage where they are into the workforce, they are able to um, keep up. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And talk about this education of the youth, especially uh, one of the, the the speakers, not just the participants, uh, was one of us, an East iconic journalist, Eric Chinje, who thinks that it is only when there is a strategic use of AI and other um, digital transformation uh, perspectives that we can progress. Let us watch him talk about the strategic use of AI and other digital uh, handouts. If we're going to transform society, we will have to figure out how we use effectively use the instruments that the media afford us. Without a strategic use of those instruments, society will never see change, certainly not in the ways that we want. On the side of the journalists who are the purveyors of information, and on the side of the recipients, the people that we are trying to influence, it's very important that a higher sense of the use of these instruments, and whether it's government that does it, or the media itself that does it, or society in general, but it has to be done so that we, we, can, we can put to the best use possible the instruments of technology that are available to us now. Whether it's social media or traditional media, whether it's um, you know new systems developed, AI-based systems, we have to make sure that our people, we have a strategy for, for doing it, and that our people understand what we're doing. If you look around, if you analyze life on Earth today, you will see how AI, artificial intelligence, is already creeping into every aspect of our life. It's as if you know you are in a there's a tsunami coming, and you're saying, "Oh well, you know, it's only water. You'd be you'd be you'd be blown out of existence." No. Uh, so the, the discussion is not about is it good, is it bad. No. It's about how do we make the most of it. And every society has to figure out. Of course, you know, there are people who would use AI for destructive purposes. They always are. People have used money. They've used gold for destructive purposes. They've used weapons for destructive purposes. So it's not a matter of you always have those people. But it's what goes, what happens to the majority That's, that matters. And with regard to artificial intelligence, the vast majority on Earth, of the 8 billion people on Earth, the vast majority, 7.5 7 billion, will be on the good side of AI. And so we should be looking at that. How do we, how do we um, leverage AI for health purposes, for agricultural purposes, for industrialization? Look at our roads. Look at, I mean, every aspect of our lives. There's one image he used there, mm -hmm. that uh, digital transformation, particularly talking about uh, artificial intelligence, has come to stay. And if you are not careful, you are not uh, alert, you see it coming, you think that a tsunami coming, you think it's water that's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, you take it for, uh, uh, for granted mm -hmm. and it takes you off guard. Um, what exactly will you say when you hear him talk about this? It has come to stay. Emma, you are into it. Yes, um, <coughs> Kilian, one of the things that uh, I was thinking when you, when you invited me for this program is I stayed in Boya and I see most young people are fighting to buy the biggest iPhones, the biggest uh, Android phones. <laughs> and When you see what they want to do with the Android phones mm -hmm. and the iPhones, you are asking yourself if it was really worth it. That is, we have very great working tools in our palms, and we just use it for very unproductive purposes. We turn 
working towards that we are going to be assets into liabilities because every day in Boya you easily and I think it's the same case with other towns you see uh, a young girl who is using an iPhone 14 or whatever mm -hmm. costing more than 400,000 francs begging for that data internet data <laughs> yes for maybe 500 or 100 francs or even asking so so it's very funny and if uh well, well, you, you, you made a very good point if he or she begged for that 100 francs data and used it effectively i think it's in terms of how they use such uh, assets how they do not allow it into library I, I think that to be able to afford that kind of device that you cannot be it's just like somebody driving a BMW Jeep and begging for fuel. Oh, it, it, it's so not... Uh, yes, yes, but uh, I, I get it. I get it. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, I, get that. That, I think that, uh, yes, yeah, so in that, one of the key things that I really want to mention is that there is need that we train di digital natives and digital citizens. The digital natives, um, there is need that we familiarize our children with the useful elements of uh, IT and uh, make them understand that they are already, we are talking of the future. I must say this is now because if you are not laying a foundation now, you are nowhere, you are not going to find yourself anywhere tomorrow. That is very, you, that is icy when yeah. you are talking about it. It's, it's uh, very delicate yeah. uh, because it's moving against the train of the thought of parents in Cameroon. I don't know how it is in, in other African countries. They are depriving their children of these um, new information and technological gadgets because they say it derails them uh, from focusing on, on their studies. Perhaps you say no. No, it's a travesty, and I say this categorically for anybody anybody even anybody in authority to deprive for example secondary school students in the dorms from taking their phones to school because that is where the technology is it annoys me when i hear this honestly uh, killian we have come in the digital world we, it is not going behind her. Eh? It is not going to get away let those kids hold their phones let them hold it in class but teach them responsible use of those phones. I hear some secondary schools don't even, especially the religious secondary schools in, in Cameroon, I hear they don't even allow ki kids to come to school with iPads or with tablets or, 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 or with phones. That is a <laughs> technological travesty. Chinese kids, Indian kids, Japanese kids, they are holding this thing all the time. But the home training on responsible use is where it matters. Now you are talking now about context. I was going to ask you that question. What if in Cameroon, our context does not warrant that we give to these children because we will give them, they will not uh, employ that into usefulness the way the others. No, there, there are <laughs> controls you can put on children's phones. Mm -hmm. If it's even to track what they do, I, I, I you can have apps yeah. from your phone as a yeah. parent. You can track where they are going to, what websites they are visiting, how they are using it. Those apps are like parents like you, my children, as I speak to you. They know how to use the phone more than I do. Uh, how do I uh, put the restrictions in their no, phone no. when they understand technology more than me? They I, certainly I, I they're, think, going I to, think, they're going. They're going to unlock that nonsense. I put. Yeah, I, 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 I can. I can answer that because there is also uh, a possibility for the government to. Because normally, when somebody buys a phone, they register it. From your registration, it's possible to be able to know the age range. Right? And mm -hmm. it's possible for the government to be able to use its powers to shut down certain sites mm -hmm. from being accessed by uh, children. That is, if you were to buy a phone for your child and you register, get the information of that your child, the phone's operating systems knows that this child is below 18. It is possible for the operating system to know that the age of this child doesn't permit doesn't permit this child to access this site, doesn't permit this. These are things like Prof is saying, we have to welcome, this is not time again that we have to start depriving our kids because if we want to continue doing this, then let's know that we want to keep our children 
in the uh, in the 90s mm -hmm. yes okay. when others are going because there is no opportunity tomorrow for a non-digital native there Thank is you. no opportunity Thank we you. have to emphasize on uh, training uh, digital citizens that is people who can be able to use these resources ethically is yes, we have to uh, invest this energy in, I think, in doing uh, this because there's no uh, other parents yeah. parents are listening to you i think we don't have anything against what you have said parents have to allow their children to use the ict gadgets they only need to play their role as their parents make sure they know how to give restrictions hold their children to order and make them grow with the world now Earlier, when Prof. Baraka was talking about the importance, uh, the opportunities of uh, uh, using digital transformation, he made mention of AI using, um, used in warfare. And the former Nigerian president, Olusigo Nabasenjo, says, if you win the digital war, that's uh, space, yes. you win the digital space, you win the war. For Absolutely. you to win any war, you have to win the digital Absolutely. space. Let us uh, watch him. He also delivered a keynote address during the last summit, ICT for Africa summit in Yamude. <laughs> in the Niger Delta area of Nigeria and the criminality that went along with militancy, especially with sabotage and stealing of oil from the pipelines. We managed to get satellite systems to observe and locate the saboteurs and the criminals and that was 20 years ago. But we had no, we had no means of dealing with them after they have been located by satellite. Today, it is a different story. With drones, we can combine locating and identifying with attacking by drones. And in warfare, in warfare today, whoever wins the electronic or digital warfare through different digital processes is likely to be the winner of a war in the end. Digital and cyber intelligence, cyber security, drones and artificial intelligence will be the major weapon of the war of today. Not too long ago. Yes, we got that clean and clear. I don't think we need comments on that. Mm -hmm. If you win the electronic war, the digital space, then in any warfare, you're going to be the winner. But now let's go to some practical uh, issues about digital transformation which some people may not see but they are the things that can actually make us progress this is raised by the former Mauritius president uh, Mrs. Uh, Bibi Amina she says agriculture if you take digital transformation into agriculture I've had people on this set who said that she also said that during this conference let us watch her the famous adage of a bird that cannot fly when one wing applies. This remarkable accomplishment shatters the traditional perception of these disciplines as male dominated, paving the way for a more equitable and diverse future in technology. It is clear that on this trajectory, you have to also find innovative ways to working with both government and private sector. Actions can include collaborative research projects, 
an innovation model, internship, workshops, seminars. It will be up to you to push the boundaries of the possible, knock on the doors, and never take no for an answer. Think and act on what you can do in the health sector, in agro-industry, in tourism, in governance, and in public administration, in transport, and on the side also, in the marine sector. With technology, the field is wide, the possibilities are endless, and the sky is your limit. Cameroon has a young and dynamic population, which presents a significant opportunity for development of the ICT sector in the country. That was actually a call, a call for action. She said Cameroon has to integrate this into agro-industry, into tourism, into governance, and into administration. I think that is so englobing. We are going to be moving out of the discussion, and these two speakers have made points that we cannot go without making some comments, without complimenting them. Beginning with you, Dina Epale. Yeah, um, I come back to what I said earlier about um, technology being the great equalizer. As our last speaker, the, the former president, said, it's, it's an opportunity, it creates opportunities, and it, the, it makes the level feel more equal when we use technology to advance those things. Um, so I think and what President, um, former President Obasanjo also said in terms of the warfare, and if you win the digital warfare, you win the, the war, so to speak. Um, that is, technology is here to stay. Right? We are not going backwards. We have to accept it. We are moving forward. We are seeing how it's being used in so many different phases and so many things to improve and give us opportunities that never existed. If I take even one example of um, facial recognition, that is a technology that has, is helping um, people around the world identify potential criminals or people who may have done um, harm. So. Yes, there is a lot of potential, and it's our opportunity to harness it. Thank you very much, um, Professor Ayini. Mm -hmm. The summit in uh, Af uh, ICT for Africa, you were the chairperson yeah. of uh, the summit. Um, how do you assess this summit in one minute? Um, it's over. Yeah, um, thank you, Kilian. Uh, this summit was a very successful one. We had several positive feedback from people from across the world, including uh, the Cameroon government officials itself. Uh, and one interest, one you know, thing that excites me about uh, this summit is also even inviting the uh, president of the Cameroon National Youth Council, uh, that's Lady Fadimatu. And doing a speech, she mentioned something because I was really, really interested in uh, that part. That what is the Cameroon government doing to support youth? in small businesses and digital stuff, small uh, tech startups. Uh, she mentioned that the Cameroon government recently released 102 billion francs. That's exact. That is a lot of money out there. That means the government is doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, towards they are interested in the digital revolution. They are interested in change. And one thing, you know, if I would advise the government as we move forward now, is I don't know how many regions we have in Cameroon. It's two, you know, uh, ten, ten regions. regions yes. Technology hubs in these ten regions. Technology hubs. Technology hubs and incubation hubs yes. for youths to come together. They have start tech um, startups company, startup companies in e-agriculture, e-commerce, fintech, and a wide variety of services. Yes, uh, and we are still on that. Moving out of this program, Professor Barika, and you are the one who engineered this. Um, we hear that it has come to Cameroon to stay. Yes. Cameroon is the capital of uh, the permanent seat of uh, ICT for Africa. Yes, uh, Kilian, uh, this conference had, had, had gone to so many African countries. It was a conference launched by the ICT University many years ago, um, but uh, uh, I was able to convince our partners, our board of trustees, that rather than move this conference to so many African countries, let's make Cameroon the center, the point of attention for this, for time immemorial to come. And we, 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 the conference will be every year now in Cameroon. Cameroon will be the sole host of ICT for Africa. And I'm so excited. 
with all the presidents, President Obasanjo, President Amina that came, but I was also very excited about the president of the National Youth Council that came, Madam Fadimatu, the Minister of Post and Telecom. They were all here. And by the way, Folusho, we have a major technological hub established by the Cameroon government right here in Yaoundé. It's a major incubator, and I agree with you, maybe now sub-incubators can be in all 10 regions. Thank There's an amazing incubator. Thank you. Thank you very as much. For good as anywhere in the developed world, it's right here in Yaoundé in Bastos. Thank you very much for what uh, all of you are doing for our country. Uh, the next uh, now uh, you already concluded. The next time you come and I uh, hope you're going to come next year, Dina Epale who is a public affairs and government relations professional, you are going to do more than the, what you've done within these past two years that you've come here. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to come to press R. Thank you, Kilian. It was my pleasure. Yes, and uh, Professor Foluso Ayeni, thank you very much. You are a uh, developer. You are building countries around. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming to build Cameroon. You are an, a Pan-African. I should. Uh, that's my description. Is not you. <laughs> thank you very much. Expert in ICT and international development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kilian. Thank you so much, my friend. Kilian. Yes, sir. So Professor Victor Mbareka, we cannot say more than this. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Emmanuel, thank you. You're going to travel back to Grand Zero. You are based in Boya. <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, it was quite it a great pleasure, and I hope Cameroonians did learn from what we shared. Of course, so much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You have a rebroadcast of this program on Monday at 2.30 on uh, CRTV Premium, and on uh, Wednesday on CRTV News at 9 p.m. That's after the news in the French language. Thank you so much. We are back to stay as ICT Digital Transformation is here in the world and in Cameroon to stay. We are going to build our country with that. Have a very blessed day ahead. <laughs>